Uh, my name is uh, John Novembre. I'm a professor at the University of Chicago. Um, and I'm going to talk today about methods to characterize geographic structure in genetic variation. So uh, this is the, the world that we live on, um, that uh, all the creatures that we're interested in live on. And it's a world that's spatially heterogeneous. As you look at it, you see areas of, of uh, where there's more moisture, where it's more arid, where there are mountain ranges, where there are um, large bodies of water. And these geographic features shape how animals move and, and how plant uh, pollen disperses. And that connectivity between populations has a huge effect on evolutionary processes and a lot of the underlying biology that interests us. So um, landscapes are really a, a key aspect of ecological and evolutionary dynamics, and they're very fundamental to study. Um, so for a lot of different problem areas, uh, there's this interest in understanding how geography impacts movement. And uh, now, thankfully, we can use genetics to uncover some of those movement patterns, those patterns of connectivity. And uh, the question, though, is if we have genetic variation data for a particular species, how do we use that genetic variation data to learn about uh, these geographic features that might be shaping how uh, animals move? Okay, so. Um, when we're saying this is what analysis approaches can we take to reveal spatial heterogeneity and connectivity in genetic variation data? And it's a key question for um, a subdiscipline that's variously called landscape genetics, geographical genetics, geogenetics, spatial genetics. And um, it's a question that's been worked on for quite some time with many answers. I'm going to talk about all of this in the context of, of population genetics, but of course you could think about this in terms of uh, microbiome community composition and how it varies over space and how that's affected by the dispersal of particular um, uh, microbial species. Okay, so, so yeah, there have been many answers to this question and, um, and they can be grouped into broad categories. So uh, one broad category is uh, approaches that try to visualize local allele frequency differentiation. And so three approaches in this area are wombling, something called Monmonier's algorithm and local diff. And I'm not going to go in great detail on each of these. I just kind of want to lay the groundwork before I present a method that we've been working on. And I'm going to try to give a tutorial that's really based on the ideas behind this new method that we've been working on. But, but yeah, to lay, lay some background on other methods that are, exist, um, uh, I'll take, for example, wombling, which is an approach where you have allele frequency data across many populations. And then you um, interpolate an allele frequency surface for many allele frequencies. And then compute a, like a local derivative and ask where that local derivative tends to be steep across many different allele frequencies. And what you get are um, the types of maps that you see on the right there. This is an old, an old figure uh, from 1990 when this method was, was popular to use. Uh, where those dashed lines represent that across many allele frequency surfaces there's a shift there. And that helps us see that there are certain features on the map areas where there's more genetic differentiation per unit of geographic distance. So you can see like around Italy, there's a lot of uh, high levels of, of, of genetic differentiation. Um, okay, so that's one category, somehow we're like working with allele frequency surfaces and kind of looking at local gradients. Another is using dimensionality reduction approaches like PCA and trying to sort of align the PCA to a map and seeing in what areas is it sort of stretched or compressed to indicate that maybe there's a, a geographic feature that's causing uh, genetic differentiation to be elevated. So um, these are approaches that were first um, uh, applied in wide scale by uh, Cavelli Sforz and colleagues. Uh, Manozzi et al. of 1978 is a key um, uh, publication. Uh, using procrustes, which is a way of uh, asking how you can um, uh, twist and stretch a one piece of uh, um, coordinates to match another uh, set of coordinates. Um, so that's been used uh, in applying PCA to geography, um, an approach that uh, we worked on here with Ron Halperin and, and Eleazar Spa and, um, and Wen Yun Yang, uh, you, like, produces an ordination that the way that that ordination sits with respect to geography also can kind of reveal where there are these uh, geographic features. Um, space mix is another one. UnPC is another one. They're all kind of similar flavor of like doing an ordination and asking about the alignment with geography. And then a third category is sort of building on uh, Sohini's talk of um, uh, where she focused on latent Dirichlet allocation models. These uh, um, the Pritchard-Stevens-Donnelly model, the admixture models, where you have these 
uh, mixture coefficients of how individuals are, um, uh, how much of their ancestry falls into one population or another, and kind of visualizing these on uh, geographic maps allows you to see where perhaps, for instance, like in this species, maybe it's the Rocky Mountains that are causing this differentiation. And there's some new work in kind of putting structure-like models into a geographic context that uh, are very relevant to addressing these problems. Okay. So, um, so long-standing question with lots of approaches. And our current proposal is called EEMS. So the EEMS is for Estimated Effective Migration Surfaces, which you can see in the title there. This is um, work that we published a couple years ago with Desi Slava Petkova as the um, first author. She was um, a statistics PhD student who really drove this work um, over many years to, to produce this uh, quite nice method. Um, the, the, the name Eames is partly a, uh, um, in its pronunciation, is partly a, uh, a hat tip to Ray and Charles Eames who were uh, furniture designers who actually lived most of their life in LA and you can go to the Eames house and uh, they were some of the first people to bend plywood to match the complex shapes of the human body to make modern furniture and uh, and here you can see these wooden splints that they developed for soldiers in World War II. That's actually where they got their start was developing these splints for soldiers then after the war they said wait we can make nice furniture and uh, so you may have seen you, you almost certainly sat, have sat in some form of an Eames chair during your life. So the idea is that we're going to be bending surfaces of our parameter values to um, help represent the complex relationship of genes to geography. And uh, so I'll try to make that more clear here. So this is an example data set of African elephant uh, DNA data from 16 microsatellites. Um, and uh, there are two major types of elephants uh, in Africa, forest elephants and savanna elephants. And uh, you can see in the green the, where the forest elephants are, where the savanna, where the um, savanna elephants, or sorry, in orange where the savanna elephants were sampled. And um, so this is a kind of like a, a, a case study where we sort of know the right answer in terms of where the genetic uh, break is. It's, it's uh, between the green and the orange here. But we'd like to have a method that would help us reveal that should we not know that it's there. Okay. And so we're going to produce a surface of what we call effective migration that um, is going to help us uh, understand how that genetic differentiation is distributed on the landscape. So on the right is our effective migration surface where you can see there's a, a feature that has low effective migration running in this kind of curved shape and that curved shape is, is following the, the boundary, the ecotone between these two habitat types. And so that's indicating that there's a lot of genetic differentiation between uh, the both sides of this um, uh, uh, boundary. And then the blue is showing areas where there's high effective migration, meaning there's a lot of genetic similarity per unit of geographic distance across um, the eastern side of this landscape. So, um, and that makes some sense. These are savanna elephants. The savanna is more open. They can move more freely. So we might expect them to have higher genetic similarity over larger geographic distances. So, what we've got now is a visualization, and you can think of it how like PCA is a summary of the data. These maps are a summary of the data that represent for us how the differentiation aligns with geography. Um, okay, and um, so I want to do a bit of a tutorial that's going to help us understand how this method works in more detail. So under the hood, the first um, uh, concept is uh, that of a stepping stone model. So stepping stone models are uh, a type of population genetic model where there's subpopulations that are arranged across space and where there's migration that occurs between neighboring populations. Um, there can be generalizations, but the, the basic model is the nearest neighbor stepping stone. The name comes from gardens in Japan where you have stepping stones that create paths like the one shown there. And the idea is that each stone is a population, and uh, the migration always occurs from one stone to the neighboring stone. Okay. And um, this uh, was first uh, brought into population genetics by Motu Kimura, um, a prominent Japanese population geneticist. Uh, the idea can be extended into two dimensions. Um, and so here, what we're actually using are these triangular um, stepping stone grids. Uh, and um, 
And then in terms of parameterizing them, then you need to specify the number of individuals within each subpopulation. Uh, so that, if you have D deems, a deem is a subpopulation. If you have uh, D, you would have D of these relative deem sizes. Um, and then you need pairwise relative migration rates, um, which you know, most generally would be sort of D by D migration matrix. Um, and you can, uh, we simplify this to have just, um, in, the, in the constructions we're going to use, to just have one migration rate per um, deem, like a migration rate associated with each deem. And then for each edge with a, a neighboring deem, you're going to take the average of the migration parameter of that deem with its neighboring deem uh, to determine the, the migration occurring across the edge. Okay. So that we end up with, with D parameters for migration. Okay. Um, Another thing to say about these stepping stone models is that as they get very fine scaled, they begin to approximate what would happen if you had a true spatial continuum of no subpopulations, just individuals distributed across the landscape, um, uh, at least for one where there's uniform density. Okay. Um, so as opposed to many population genetic models that have you know, sort of two or three major deems, uh, this, you have like so many that in some ways you can approximate a continuum might be more realistic for many species. Okay, so um, that's the basic population model. Um, then within that model, a key thing to think about is what are the pairwise coalescent times? So how much time do we have to go back into the past until two lineages have a common ancestor? So in particular, like say, um, the piece of DNA that my mother gave me, the piece of DNA that my father gave me, how far back do I have to go until those two pieces of DNA were actually handed down to two different offspring by a single common ancestor? That time is really essential for determining how different two pieces of DNA will be. If that time was deep into the past, then my two pieces of DNA will be different and I'll be a heterozygote at that location in the genome. If they were very recent, then my two pieces of DNA will be similar and I'll be a homozygote. So coalescent times predict genetic divergence. So if we can solve for coalescent times in a uh, population model, then we can predict observed patterns of genetic dissimilarity. And so um, the question is, how can we get these coalescent times out of stepping stone models? And the um, brute force way is that there is a set of equations that um, uh, describe you know, properties of pairwise coalescent times and stepping stone models that uh, can be solved. And the problem is that they are they scale with d to the fifth, um, where d is the number of deems that you're looking at. Okay, so that's really heinous. And so um, to actually do anything in practice, what you want to do is um, is make some approximations. And so the approximation uh, that we're using is built on uh, tools that um, a uh, individual named Brad McRae brought into population genetics. So Brad was an electrical engineer who um, had a lot of experience with something called resistance distances. And these are uh, distances that electrical engineers use to measure how much resistance exists between uh, two points on a large network of resistors. And, um, and so uh, electrons can flow in a circuit through like all possible paths. And so this distance is a measure that uh, sums over all possible paths that a, uh, a, a flow in this circuit um, network and, uh, and then returns a um, you know, an effective resistance, okay? And so um, what he realized is that the mathematics of that apply uh, quite well to how two genes would move in a stepping stone model uh, going backwards in time. So when we think about, um, if I want to ask about the coalescent time between two different points, I need to think about how the ancestors would through time, move back and come to contact each other. Well, there's a, in thinking about that time, we need to think about all possible paths that the ancestors could have taken. So 
um, both of these like application areas have a notion of, of summing over a large number of possible paths through a network. And in fact, both of them connect to ideas of random walks on graphs. And so it turns out resistance distances are equal to something known as a commute time on a, on a graph. So if we have a random walker on a graph, the commute time is the time for, to go from uh, between like points I and J is the time to go from I to J and then back again, okay? Which, um, yeah, and you know, averaging over all possible paths. It's that average time. Uh, and so the coalescent time can be approximated as about one fourth of that time. Because like if we start one point here, one point here, think about like the ancestors need to come and you know, probably kind of meet in the middle. The commute time is going one, over to one and then back again. So it's about twice the length as opposed to the, the coalescent time in some ways you know, going to be about uh, half the, you know, proportional to like half the length, roughly speaking. So, so by taking, yeah, four times the, the, the pairwise time for lineages to meet in a deem is what these resistance distances will give you. Um, okay, and... Uh, Okay, so um, this, this idea, just to kind of flesh it out a little more, helps, um, and maybe I'll do it in the next slide, but, um, well, I'll, I'll point out one thing here. Like, you start to realize, for instance, that like for the same geographic distance that two points might be separated, like here over by B, with that, those two points that are separated uh, vertically, they will have a very different expected coalescent time and in turns expected level of genetic divergence than uh, the points that are separated across between A and B um, because those two are only connected by paths through that little isthmus. So there are many fewer paths that can connect those two um, and uh, or, the, or the paths are on average longer uh, because uh, you have to kind of go through that isthmus so you'll on average be more different. Okay. Um, so uh, this distance Brad was able to show predicts genetic differences quite well. And so these are um, examples where uh, it's data from wolverines. That's the little critter there that you see in the lower, the, in, in an icon form on the uh, lower left of panel A. The gray area uh, might take a moment for you to recognize it, but the upper left is Alaska. And then it's running down sort of along the Pacific coast and into sort of the um, mountains of British Columbia. And then you go um, uh, eastwards, and that's the whole range of this of this critter. And um, so, in computing like the expected genetic distance between two points in blue here, we might like naively start with using just geographic distance, and that would do a really poor job at prediction. So, in these plots where the y-axis is a genetic distance based on FST. Um, so increasing genetic distance as you go up the y-axis. Uh, in those genetic distance versus geographic distance plots, you get a very poor prediction using like raw geographic distance. So you might say, okay, well, I can do better. I'll use a least cost path distance where I say, what's the cheapest way to get from uh, one position to the other without going through this area where the wolverines can't actually live? That improves the, the, uh, the, the fit but not as much as an approach using resistance distance where you average over all possible paths and get an expected distance. So um, that's what you see in the upper right. Thinking about um, uh, these dynamics is kind of really helpful for like building your intuition about how genetic distances exist in a spatial population. So there's some interesting effects like, for instance, if we lopped off Alaska it would actually, you know, we would predict that there are like fewer long paths where like the two parents go for a long time back into Alaska, you know. It would be sort of quicker for the two parental lines to meet each other because, yeah, you know, without that extra space. So you'd actually have uh, shorter coalescent times on average. You'd have less genetic distance on average. And so it's this funny thing where even if you're sampling like two corners of the habitat, what's occurring way out there, in principle at least, should actually impact their level of genetic similarity. Because even though they don't live there, their ancestors might have lived back there. Okay, um, okay I say in principle because in practice maybe 
most of the lineages might not pass through there, and so it may have like just a weak effect, maybe not be detectable in data. Okay, so, um, so this resistance distance idea is uh, compelling as a way to try to model genetic distances. Um, one challenge with it, though, is that it, it doesn't account for varying population size. So uh, remember when I said it's, it's related to random walks on graphs, there's no notion of, um, of, of yeah, a local population size or like when these two lineages meet each other that they're going to have to, like in some subpopulation, that they might actually have to wait within that subpopulation to find a, a, a common ancestor. So, um, yeah, so the resistance distances, they're determined solely by the edge weights, the migration parameters. There's nothing that actually um, addresses the fact that like once you're at the same location, there's a pool of people that you could, you know, that, the, that you need to mate with to actually have a common ancestor event occur, or like for a coalescence to occur. So um, one, one uh, extension that you can do is to uh, separate out your model for the pairwise coalescent time into two parts. A part that is the time that is between deems of how long it takes lineages that are um, in two different deems to come together to the same deem, and then an additional waiting time for a coalescence to occur after they've come to the same location. And so um, this is uh, how we've written out a, a, a split between the two. Um, the part of breaking it between deems and within deems is, is not an approximation, but putting it in this exact form with this TA plus TB over two is an approximation. What we're doing there is effectively saying, is what you'd like to do is say that you're, you're, you have a time to go back, and then there's some location where they meet, and then there's some local time there for the final coalescence to occur. But we don't know where that is. So, you know, the, the proper way would be to sort of sum over all possible places where they could meet, but that's an additional sum that we don't want to do. So what do we do? We say that the time at where the time length for them to coalesce is going to be just an average of the time of their two starting locations. Okay, um, So that's that T alpha plus T beta. If you started in alpha, you start in beta, there's some time to get to the same deem, and then the extra time is just going to be an average of the local time of where you started. Okay? This should work pretty well when you tend to coalesce in areas near where you actually started. Um, <laughs> Okay, so, and what it means in terms of just like the number of parameters in this model is that we're gonna have the migration rates that, of the stepping stone model that uh, determine these resistance distances, then the between beam component, and then we're gonna have local um, parameters for diversity that determine this within beam coalescent time. And um, so we're re-specifying the model instead of migration rates and population sizes in terms of migration rates and a local um, coalescent time or diversity rate. Um, okay, so that's uh, some key background for the method. I want to give a little one more piece of background, which is um, the challenge of dealing with uneven sampling schemes. And I'm, I'm going to highlight it in terms of a behavior of PCA. So, one challenge with running PCA is that if you have clustered sampling, you will get clusters in your data even if nature is actually spatially homogeneous, okay? And this actually occurs with admixture models as well, and there was a period in sort of the early 2000s after the first big structure papers were published where people debated are the clusters we're seeing in human genetic data actually because there's real clusters on the ground or because the sampling is clustered. And so this is a demonstration of that where we have a scenario with uniform migration on the left, a scenario where there's a depression of migration north-south in, in a scenario on the right. Okay, um, and the sampling scheme is on, shown on the left here with the size of the dots representing the number of samples coming from any one location. And so you can see there's a gap of sampling in the middle. These gaps are commonplace just because of the logistics of sampling. You know, you sample one place, you go somewhere else, you, there's, a, you know, there's a gap in between. Um, people rarely are able to get continuous samples across space. So even if you have uniform migration, the PCA on this data will produce two clusters at, you know, just as you'll get with 
um, a reduction in gene flow. You know, the exact shapes differ, but the, um, the presence of two clusters is there. Okay? Um, other ways in which this has been described are in this great paper by Gil McVean, where um, he uh, relates uh, PCA to a lot of population genetic theory and coalescence. And he's uh, showing examples. We have a three by three stepping stone model. And then he's showing in this panel, you oversample the red population on the left side of the grid. And because you've oversampled it, PCA stretches that population out from the rest of them. And then this is a more complex sampling scheme where you get a very distorted picture. So you really have to be careful where you see, oh, you know, like if you got these results from the second, you say, oh, the red population is, is somehow really special and different from the rest of the populations. In fact, the only thing that's special about it is that you've sampled it intensely. And PCA and trying to like represent the data, the sampled data in as few um, dimensions as possible, it, it gains from sort of explaining the very well sampled data relative to the rest. And so it stretches it out. Um, an empirical example of this is from, I can show from some of my own work, where uh, this is this uh, uh, PCA of populations from across Europe that has this geographic map-like quality of, of mirroring the um, geography of Europe. But if we pump in 500 Sardinian individuals, which I've done in here, and add it to the data set, rerun PCA, I get this completely distorted picture. And so I would say, oh, you know, Europe is sort of this compressed, uh, you know, there's like lots of overlap and, you know, uh, there's, it's not that cleanly geographical, um, but that's, you know, this is still in the data. It's just being distorted by the PC1 now trying to map out more of the Sardinian versus mainland Europe differentiation. Okay. So this sensitivity to uneven sampling in, in PCA is sort of this vexing issue that you know, we, we, we might hope to try to um, improve upon in developing a new method. OK, so um, all right, so how does this Eames method work then? Um, so we start with a dense grid of populations. And so I'm going to do this in the context of that African data. So what we do is we assume that there is this dense grid of populations across a broad habitat area encompassing the area that we've sampled. Okay. This grid is actually one of our kind of Achilles heel of like we have to assume a grid shape and exactly what shape you assume, where do you draw the boundaries, um, how dense do you make it is, is kind of an open question. In practice, we find if we make it very fine-grained, um, uh, the results tend to be more robust. Um, and, uh, and I'll say something about this in a, in a minute too. But OK, so we have this basic grid of populations that define a stepping stone model. Then we have these local migration rates and diversity rates um, that help build, uh, as I mentioned, kind of they, they underlie our ability to compute pairwise coalescent times. Okay? And then those pairwise coalescent times, as I mentioned, imply expected pairwise genetic dissimilarity. Okay? And, um, and then we have our observed genetic dissimilarity. So we need to be able to calculate sort of the probability of our observed genetic dissimilarity under this model where we can specify expected genetic dissimilarity. And so the way that we do that is to use a Wishart um, distribution, which is a uh, distribution that works on um, uh, uh, matrices that are yeah, non-negative matrices. And, um, and it can be parameterized using a mean matrix and then a degrees of freedom that specifies is how any realization, how far any realization will be from that expected matrix. Okay. So it's kind of like a, you know, kind of like thinking about a normal distribution. We have a mean and a variance. Here we have a mean matrix and a degrees of freedom that's specifying the noise around that. We're going to learn that, that, um, that uh, degrees of freedom parameter from the data. Okay. Now, um, you know, Many of you, you know, here do methods development. I say, John, this is crazy. There's so many parameters to estimate because you have one for each of these deems and uh, for the migration rates and also for the diversity uh, parameters. So you know, how is this possible? The, the key is that um, we're doing this in a Bayesian context and we're taking advantage of having a, a prior. Um, and uh, you can think of this as a kind of regularization as well. But um, the prior that we use is that the migration rates and the diversity rates will each have their own 
um, Voronoi tessellation as a solution so that we can model the parameters as being um, distributed according to uh, a particular tiling of the space where each tile has its own parameter value. So that's what you're seeing up here in the upper right is a set of tiles where uh, there are tiles that are a, have a blue value associated with them, other ones with a brown. And um, so that greatly reduces the number of parameters. It's sort of like our effective number of parameters is closer to the number of tiles in the tiling. Okay. Um, and so uh, we end up then having to specify the centers of each tile. And then for each tile, we have a migration rate and a, and a diversity parameter. Um, yeah. Uh, the, the prior doesn't have any real geography in it. It's just like we're, um, the prior is sampling from the space of all tessellations and then uh, with any tile has a, under the prior has a, um, a pretty flat distribution on what the migration rates and diversity rates will be. Okay. And what you're seeing there is that like is actually a draw from the posterior. So it's after yeah, sorry, that is a draw from the posterior, but the sh uh, yeah, more to make the shape of the, the point that the, the tessellation structure is what determines the prior. Okay. Yeah, so, so we start by just sprinkling these tile centers down, uh, assigning some random migration rates and diversity parameters, and then doing an MCMC where we perturb the tile centers and the values associated with each tile, uh, and um, that ends up converging on a posterior distribution where um, uh, you know for for these migration rates and diversity parameters. Um, okay, so and then we do reversible jump MCMC in that we like will add tiles or remove tiles to like be able to capture more complex surfaces if it's very complex. Okay. So um, after using this MCMC, then we can take all of these realizations from the posterior of the tilings and average to get a local mean posterior migration rate and a mean posterior diversity rate. And those are like the kind of maps that I showed you um, as, as the results, okay? So yeah, so in practice, we get um, two different maps. I'll show those in a second. But any questions before I go on here? Because this is really kind of the guts of the thing. And it's, it's sort of fun to dwell on it. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, so um, that's right. So the solutions for the resistance distances and in terms of our, our approximation of Paris coefficient assume an equilibrium that like the edge weights have not been changing through time. And um, so that's, uh, yeah, so our model is of no change through time, which then means kind of in practice, our inferred values are sort of a time average. You know, it's sort of just like, and, and that's why we say effective parameters. They're not like exactly what the migration rates are. They're a sort of um, a set of migration parameters that would fit the data if things were constant through time. Okay. Yeah, and I'm going to come to time, our long-term goal is to be able to do more and more about like separating it out through time. Yeah. yeah. Well, so for the discrete model, we have a uh, ability to compute these coalescent times. For the coal, for continuous time, continuous space coalescent is is kind of a difficult, difficult to work with mathematically, and especially if it's spatially heterogeneous. Yeah. I. Yeah. I. I. Um, yeah. We. Uh, yeah. So there are some approaches now that we we've, we've seen that we think we could use, but. For our, in our hands, it was sort of like, this seemed like a better path. Um, you know, an interesting thing is that a lot of those approaches that do integrals over continuous space, to numerically solve them, they discretize. And so with fine meshes. And so I think that you're going to get something that's quite similar either way, as long as these grids are quite fine. Yeah. Um, OK, so in practice, we get these two maps out, an effective migration surface and effective diversity surface. Okay? Um, and, uh, and these are the results for that elephant data. So you see that actually the savannah elephants have sort of lower diversity on average than, than the um, 
the forest elephants. Uh, we found that the, the diversity surfaces are sensitive to ascertainment bias of like where did you discover the markers that you're using. And so we tend to focus on just the migration surface um, in, in uh, presenting results. So, and I'll show you an example of that um, if I, um, uh, shortly. Okay, so let's return to this issue of sampling scheme with uh, how PCA shows these clusters. A nice thing is that here we actually are including the sampling locations in our analysis. So we can, the, the model can kind of inherently correct for the fact that you don't have complete sampling. So when we, oh sorry, when we run EMS on these uh, two scenarios, we get for the north-south reduction in gene flow, a north-south reduction in gene flow. When we run it on the flat map uniform migration case, we get a flat map of, of with showing no features. Okay, so that's that's really really um, encouraging and sort of a, you know one key advantage that we uh, have so far. Um, but yeah, I want to emphasize that Eames is an effective migration map is effective migration, not only because of this, um, the way that the model is not really reality, it's just a tool that we're using, but also that in population genetics, you have this complication that um, unless you bring in some like third source of data, you're, uh, like, uh, you have an entanglement between um, parameters. So the migration rate is always coupled with the population size. You could kind of speed up the migration process and slow down the um, and, and decrease your number of individuals per population and still get the same overall levels of, of similarity. So, um, so what that means is that uh, situations like this one, we have a north-south trough in migration that results in an inferred north-south trough migration. Very clear. Okay, I'm saying migration. Makes sense. You could be confused where you have a north-south trough of population size. So population sizes are lower in the middle. Migrations is constant, but population sizes are lower. You'll still get this inference, okay? So yeah, um, yeah. population genesis is called this effective migration. It's NM, not just M. Um, and yet, in terms of like understanding data, the fact that there's a trough of population size here means that there's sort of more genetic drift occurring and these two ends of the habitat will be more different from each other than if you had constant population size. So this does represent a pattern in the data that these two ends are more different than you would expect given their geographic distance. It's just that the reasoning for it is not you know, migration of how much people are moving, but that there's lower population sizes through one area. And so this is all kind of to say that we view EAMS as a, like a model-based visualization technique. That we use it to reveal structure in the data, but not to carry out precise parameter inference because of these sort of complexities. Okay. And so how does it perform in practice? Um, so this is an example that I like from uh, these blunt-nosed leopard lizards. It's not from not too far away from here. Uh, so here's the Mojave Desert. Here are the mountains that run up the coast. There's the Sierra Nevada. Um, the Tehachapi Mountains uh, kind of cutting across. Um, if you've driven through over the grapevine, it's sort of around here. And um, these are lizards sampled all across uh, this uh, um, space. Uh, these are the results from running structure. Um, and uh, what you'll see on the map that's interesting is this Tulare Lake, which if any of you have driven the, the Central Valley, you'll say, wait, I don't remember a very large lake in the Central Valley. And you would be correct because that lake, if you look it up on Google Maps, looks like this, okay? Uh, about a hundred years ago, it was completely um, drained and converted to agricultural land. Okay, um, and uh, yet that feature has existed for quite a long time, and it's actually structured the genetic variation of uh, these lizards, and that's partly revealed quite nicely by running EMS on the genetic data from the species and seeing this low area of gene flow where Tulare Lake is and where the inlet to the lake was um, running south. Um, and, uh, and then here you see low areas of gene flow around these mountains. Um, and so that persistence of population structure, even though the lake is gone, is sort of what's in their title there, persistent population structure in endangered species. So we're seeing how this tool allows one to like, quickly see an interesting feature in how the genes relate to geography, as opposed to when you run structure and you have the map, you need to spend a long time kind of going, okay, well, Kettleman heals, okay. And then there's Pidwee Allensworth. Here's Pidley Allensworth. 
okay, Cuttable Hills, oh, they're different, you know, they're different clusters. Uh, there's Tulare Lake, well, are they different? Is that a lot for the geographic distance? You know, there's a, a lot of baggage there that this hopefully just kind of, boom, you see that per unit genetic distance, there's, there's elevated differentiation in that space, okay? So we've been applying this to large-scale human data, um, and I'll be, yeah, maybe brief in the details and the spirit of CGSI of, uh, uh, we spent a lot of time on the methods, but there's a large number of individuals here, about 9,000 individuals, pretty heroic effort by my uh, former postdoc, Ben Peter, in putting this together. Um, before I show the results, I want to um, take a moment to just put human variation in perspective, okay? Because we show these structure results, we show, like I'm gonna show these Eames results, and yet, uh, and they can sort of give the visual impression of human groups being very differentiated, but in the context of our primate cousins, this is a paper that came out in 2001, uh, that was one of the first papers to sequence a large section of the X chromosome of any chromosome in multiple individuals. So this is um, a distance-based tree where the branch length ref reflects genetic divergence. And uh, uh, what's neat is you see the species level structure, but you also see within each species how much genetic diversity there is by the branch lengths that you see. Okay. And this is one of these puzzling phenomena about human population genetics that um, even though we physically show all sorts of uh, phenotypic differentiation in skin pigmentation, hair color, eye color, um, we actually on average are genetically less diverse than our primate cousins who if we go to the zoo to our eye look basically identical. Um, and uh, it's partly because we so recently were a population in Africa spread out across the globe and then selection makes our skin pigmentation change different colors quite quickly. That's like on the outside of us, on the inside, we're actually all quite genetically similar with like one difference per thousand base pairs. And so even in like very objective way, we have a low genetic level diversity relative to other primates. Um, LD, yeah, uh, I, I don't, I mean, I think their LD would, yeah, it's a good question, yeah, we might actually have, I, I don't know the answer, so I'll just start with that, but, um, uh, you know, the big difference for humans is that we have a huge abundance of rare variants, because we were a small population, but we, we've grown so uh, immensely that, like, if you measure diversity by the total number of variants, we have much more, but the variants that we have tend to be like arisen just in the last few generations or, or you know, and so, um, uh, but those variants are so rare that they actually rarely differ between two people, which is what makes us on average pairwise quite similar to each other. Does that make sense? So, okay, and, uh, and then another point is that, yeah, so to, to like be able to distinguish population structure, we actually need a large number of loci. So this is a PCA of that same European data set with just 100 SNPs, 1,000 SNPs, 10,000 SNPs, 100,000 SNPs. You need the sort of, to get 10,000 and above to start seeing the structure within Europe, okay? Because it's really, you know, quite subtle on an absolute scale. Okay, so with that little primer, I want to start showing results from, uh, from Eames. And uh, so this is the results from looking at um, Africa and Eurasia, the main area that we analyzed. And um, okay, and I'm showing it next to a PCA plot. And um, I first just want to make some comments about sort of PCA versus Eames and sort of what you, what you see in each of them. Um, so we've got the, the blue and brown color scale that I've already been showing. We've got these dashed lines that reflect areas in the posterior distribution where we're confidently continually seeing that the migration is inferred to be um, lower than the average, okay? And so, um, so for the moment, like focus on say like, you see how there's this um, low areas through the Mediterranean, through the um, uh, Red Sea, that's A7, around the Persian Gulf, like A8. So you see those features that we'd all kind of take to probably be real features of, of the geography and genetics of humans. In the PCA, try to like pull that out, right? You're not gonna see it in PC1 versus PC2. You're gonna have to go to three, four, five, and you're gonna have to like align the geography to get that signal out. So, so point here is that like while a PCA plot like this can reveal the broad structure of the data set and does get you like broad scale geography, we're sort of liking these in that they can simultaneously re represent 
broad scale and like quite fine scale features. Okay. So, um, so let's drill down on just like one region at a time. So this is Africa. Um, and the main feature there is, is a feature running through the Sahara and then coming kind of curving down to the coast of East Africa. And then uh, that's, of course, you know, um, like more easy to understand when you look at the, the language map of Africa where you see that um, the Afroasiatic languages are kind of spoken in a region that's sort of north of the, um, the Sahara and then wrapping down to East Africa. So we think that that's sort of a, 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 a mirroring of where you can sort of gain more confidence that the, this representation of genetics is working well because sort of it's tracking the linguistics. Um, and so you have sort of the Niger-Congo speaking like Bantu languages uh, south of that feature in general. Then um, another feature is this like A21 kind of around um, uh, kind of the northern part of southern Africa like near the Kalahari Desert and this is the area where there's a lot of Khoisan speakers and um, so that also sort of makes some sense coming out. And then we have this other feature, A20, that's um, kind of in the Congo area where you also have um, some, some uh, quite d diverged groups from their neighbors. So um, that's uh, like a snapshot view of the genetic diversity of Africa. Oh, you also see um, kind of features kind of just right around Madagascar, which is uh, a you know, place that's actually genetically quite distinct because they actually have a lot of um, uh, admixture from Southeast Asia. Okay, so that's... Um, the view of Africa. When we look at uh, Eurasia, we see, uh, okay, yeah, we started late, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so uh, um, yeah, so this is the view of, of Eurasia and with a satellite view, and you can see that a lot of these are aligning not only with those sea features that I mentioned before, but like with the Ural Mountains, the Himalaya, um, the kind of dry areas of the Gobi Desert, et cetera. So we're kind of encouraged by these results in humans that we can apply this in other species and expect it to maybe work where, um, because it's sort of aligning with a lot of features that we think of structured human genetic variation. So, um, okay, this is about that ascertainment bias and the effect. With some data sets, you can actually um, uh, ask to like, just look at SNPs that exist in French, a French individual, in a Chinese individual, in a Pop one individual, in a San individual, and the diversity surfaces show the most diversity in whatever region you sample your individual from, but the migration surfaces are relatively constant. So that's really encouraging in terms of the method being for migration being robust to ascertainment. Um, so I'll skip that. And then um, we're now working on an approach to look at migration rates changing through time by looking at long shared haplotype segments because long segments of shared haplotype identity reflect very recent genetic similarity. So if you filter on just analyzing that data, that like a genetic similarity matrix just based on long segments of similarity, you get insight to just the recent past. Okay? And, um, and so doing that, we can do things like this where we have a barrier that uh, appears just 10 generations ago and in one map, we don't see it. In the other map, we do, uh, based on how we filter the length scales of our analysis. Okay. And so just to close, um, so using these approximate coalescent-based approaches, we can reveal spatial heterogeneity, population structure, even controlling for uneven sampling schemes. Uh, there are some inevitable challenges. This habitat shape and grid resolution is user-specified. I gave some hint that like, if you make them fine scaled, it might be like approximating something continuous and therefore like, be less important what the resolution is, but the shape would still matter. There's still uncertainty induced by sampling gaps in that like, where if, if there's some low migration feature and you haven't sampled anywhere near it, it can like, move around in the posterior. There's not a lot of ability to localize it. So, um, but sampling gaps at least don't induce the appearance of, uh, of of some kind of clustering where it might not be there. Um, so I included the readings, you know, recommendations, but this House and Hahn paper is a recent paper that evaluates different methods for studying spatial population genetic structure, so it's a nice one, as well as uh, Desi's paper has a, the supplemental info is quite rich, so I encourage you to, to look at it. Um, all in all, I view this as sort of a step towards a dream, that it's not quite, you know, all that one would hope for, but it's towards the, the day where we might be able to have maps layered through time that have like directional migration as, uh, as well. So, um, so just want to acknowledge that the team that worked on this together
um, and the participants who um, helped make the data possible. And then uh, Brad, who's, who sadly passed away last year, but um, uh, you know, for his seminal contributions and it's kind of mixing, and I think that's the spirit of a meeting like this, mixing ideas from electrical engineering and population genetics and maybe microbiome and population genetics. We can you know, carry on that spirit. Okay, so that's, uh, that's it. I'll stop so we can start thinking about the Hollywood Bowl. Um, yeah, I don't know if there's time for questions or... That's right, yeah, yeah. That's right, yeah, longitude, latitude, yeah. Yeah, and I kind of, I don't mean to beat too hard on PCA, like it's, um, I obviously have a, a love-hate relationship, but you know, like it's, it, it's, it does amazing things and it's incredibly useful for, um, you know, it's like where you kind of, you should start in exploring your data. But for, you know, uh, you know, you know, you don't want to push it too far. So, you know, I, I guess one, one way of introducing this project is that with that PCA map of Europe, people have, you know, asked me, well, there's a little bit of a stretch here. Does that mean that, like, you know, the, there's, you can see the English Channel or you can see the Pyrenees? And it's very touchy to try to do that because if the sampling's a little uneven, it's going to stretch things apart. And so it's more that um, for that finer scale inference, uh, you know, these kind of tools could be really useful.